Okay. Thank you, Luis, for the kind int introduction. Thank you all for coming. Uh, I have to admit, it's my first time being in Ireland at all. So it's a real first for me, and I hope uh, you will remember this talk after I've finished. Uh, the title is obviously Surfing on Electron Waves Through Potential Surfaces. And uh, I try to sum it all up in, in this intro picture. We have a potential landscape down here, and I'm going to explain a bit further what I mean by that. And then we have uh, to keep in mind that electrons can be particles streaking down like these greenish balls, or they can also be waves. And we will have to treat electrons as particles or waves in the course of this talk. So just keep this in mind. Uh, we have to switch between these two representations quite frequently. Uh, I also want to point out that the surfer here is not me. Uh, it would be a disaster. So this is just the intro part of, of the image. And this is the outline of the talk, the first outline. I will give a more specific one later on. Um, because I learned that the invitation has been distributed to uh, other faculties rather than physics alone, I figured it might be helpful to dig into the uh, phrases of potential and phase uh, a little just to get started. And then I will start with the past of electron microscopy. Don't be worried, this will not be a historic uh, talk, just to give you some idea of where electron microscopy came initially from. Um, and we go to the present. I'll show you some current techniques and machines. And especially, this is the main topic of the talk, differential phase contrast. This is the technique I'm using a lot, which I am proud to say I developed quite a bit, but learned initially from John Cowley from Glasgow University, who was obviously the first person who really implemented it into an electron microscope. And then in the end, I'll talk briefly about the future, because I do have some ideas where uh, electron microscopy and this in special differential phase contrast might want to go in the future. And maybe there are one or two ideas which you find worth to think about and, and maybe even follow. OK, so what's potential and phase? I start with uh, a common view of Ireland. Uh, let's get rid of the trees. We don't have trees in, in our samples. Uh, let's get rid of the color, and we have what we see, a potential landscape. If you look just at the uh, grayish uh, shadings, we see there are slopes or wedges on a medium range uh, system. And you may notice here's a pole, a flagpole. We know there's a hole. There are atomically sharp, uh, short-ranged holes. And we know what happens if we drop a ball from the top. Ah, this is the physicist's representation of this hole. It's a, a potential uh, well. But if we drop a ball onto one of these uh, grounds, we see here's the slope. The ball is being deflected. And now if you replace the golf ball by an electron, uh, the electron is being deflected because the potential surface of this ground here has been uh, tilted, and we measure ba basically the tilting of the potential surface. Now, potential, uh, our matter consists of atoms. Atoms consist of strongly concentrated charge in the nuclei, and this is where the charge and the potential comes from. So whenever we shoot an electron through a piece of specimen, the electron will experience deflection or alterations by many, many potentials. And this, in the end, gives an outgoing wave. If you consider an ingoing electron being a, a blanket, stiff blanket, and you let the blanket settle down onto your specimen, every potential source, every atomic nucleus, will cause, cause a bump in this blanket. In the end, the blanket will look exactly like the surface of, of the screen. Uh, and this is all we can know about the specimen. So our attempt will be now to retrieve the shape of this blanket, of this potential surface. And uh, potential you may also take as identical to the phase map. It means every electron that comes down in form of a, of a plane wave, when it hits a potential, there will be a re retardation of the phase, which means you get a bumpy 
surface. And so we can measure the phases or the potentials by measuring these, uh, these areas, these bumpy uh, blankets. And for electrons, the sources of these bumps are either electrostatic or magnetic potentials. So this is just to start with. Now let's go to the past. And this has been the sketch of the first electron microscope ever built by uh, Ernst Ruska. And here you see it uh, as it was built in a real physical shape, 1931. And here you see Ernst Ruska and his co-worker Max Knoll when they operated the microscope. And here, this is a light microscopic image of a metallic grid. And the same grid was imaged with an electron microscope at a magnification of 12 times. And they were very happy at that time to see you could image something at magnification 12 times in the same quality with electrons uh, compared to the light. Nowadays, things have evolved quite a bit. For example, this has been operated, I forgot the, the exact number, but I, I would guess somewhere in, in the 20 to 50 kilovolt range. You see even the open high voltage uh, connectors up there. Uh, nowadays, people go up to three megavolts. One of these microscopes is here in Toulouse at this same as CNRS. Inside this big ball, you see here we have for scaling purpose, we have a couple of persons standing around. This is inside, this is the high voltage generation. And you may notice this is Peter Nellist from Oxford. And he told me he's exactly two meters high. So you may imagine a, a little bit the dimensions of, of this high voltage uh, chamber. And in the beginning, an electron microscope was more or less treated like a light microscope, but being bottoms up. So we had a light source up here. It's our filament. Then we have the condenser lens, which focuses or projects the light onto the specimen here. And the objective lens forms a diffraction pattern somewhere here. And then we have multiple magnification steps. The same thing is in here. We have the condenser. The specimen would sit here, the objective. And then we have some lenses to magnify the image to our eyes. And to get contrast, initially, we would put an aperture in here to cut out any diffracted beams in the specimen. And if we cut out certain electron beams, we are losing intensity. So we do get contrast. Areas where we have a lot of diffraction will get darker. Areas where we have no diffraction will be brighter. So this has been the first a simple approach to get amplitude contrast. Now, electron microscopy has evolved. And these are just acronyms which are used nowadays to describe all the different techniques we have in electron microscopy. Uh, don't try to even read them all. Uh, there are really many. And from all these, I just took out two techniques. One is differential phase contrast, or briefly DPC and STEM, the scanning transmission electron microscopy. Now, what's that about? We see it here. We have an electron gun that emits electrons. And the condenser lens illuminates a hole in an aperture. This is an evenly illuminated hole, which uh, then is projected onto the specimen down here. You see the upper, upper objective pole piece just projects it as a tiny probe onto the specimen. And we have these uh, additional deflection scan coils, which do nothing else than moving the spot from here to here, back and forth in, in a raster type scanning to get every pixel of the specimen illuminated sequentially. And in the end, we do have another lens which projects all the beams that come out of the specimen onto either a central bright field detector or an annular dark field detector, which is uh, outside. And you may see here the black uh, lines. They are the undistorted, the undeflected beams. So they hit all the bright field detector, whereas the deflected red beams are deflected sideways. They hit the annular dark field detector. And by doing so, this is 
uh, a simple image. We have here an annular bright field and an annular dark field. We have the incoming beam, the specimen, and we see the electrons are spread spatially. And depending on uh, the interaction, we understand, we start to understand in more detail what these electrons that hit the annular dark field detector mean to us compared to the annular bright field or if there is a central detector which I call the bright field detector here. And you see we do get for different specimens, we do get all different kinds of contrasts which we learn more and more about to understand in more detail what we see exactly there. And I would like to mention the 2020 Kavli Prize. The Kavli Prize, in case you haven't heard of it, is the little brother of the Nobel Prize. And it was awarded for sub-angstrom resolution imaging and chemical analysis using electron beams. And I would like to simply show you the forefathers of this development. Harald Rose, who did the theory. Max Haider, who did the practical work. Uh, Knut Urban, who pushed a lot the work and organized the money for it, and Andrei Krivenek, who on his own developed a corrector uh, for the Nyan microscopes. And uh, I find it's quite amusing to uh, know that Max Haider, uh, initially, he's an Austrian, and initially he made his master in, optical, uh, in optics, in light optics, grinding lenses and so on. And he ended up in electron microscopy doing uh, this corrector, and he owned, until recently, he, he owned his own company, Sears, where they built correctors like this, um, which are able to correct the spherical aberration of, of the lenses, which are inherently present for uh, magnetic lenses. OK, uh, sub-angstroms nowadays means we can go down to 45 picometers in resolution, which means the illuminating spot which shines on the specimen is 45 picometers only, which is smaller than an atom, which is very nice because we can now explore the space between the atoms also. And uh, there's another nice number uh, of five picometers, which is the position to which you can determine the position of a certain atom. OK, now this is the more uh, detailed outline of the talk. We are in the present. I'm going to talk about the differential phase contrast, about the beam specimen interaction uh, between the electron and electrostatic fields or the electron and magnetic fields. Uh, the type of interaction may be with homogeneous or inhomogeneous fields. Uh, I will show you some detectors the four quadrant detector, which we have in our lab, uh, the position sensitive device, or a camera type a pixelated detector. And the examples will include some um, semiconductor. This is a quantum well embedded into uh, some substrate layers. This is a conventional bright field image. If we apply our uh, differential phase contrast, this is what you get. You get a lot more of information, a lot more contrast out of it. Uh, we can do biological specimens. This is a kidney uh, preparation. And we see a lot of uh, these inner uh, cell compartments. I'm, I'm not the person to explain biological spe specimens to me. It's just nice to see we can even get there, nice contrast, and it will be for the future to talk to biologists to see what we can do for them. Um, again, this is our situation in the microscope. We have two specimens here. One specimen has a thickness of T and is filled by an electric field. The other specimen has the same thickness and is filled by a magnetic induction pointing into the plane of projection. Now, if we have our electrons coming in, uh, we know what's going to happen. The electrons are being deflected and they form this angle beta with the incoming beam. Uh, this, due to historical reasons in magnetic imaging, we call the Lorentz angle. And um, this is the particle image. Now let's switch over to the wave optics. We have the incoming plane waves. And the incoming plane wave is tilted sideways. 
by the action of the potentials. And we find the same angle beta over here again. And we see the included induction within this box just defines the phase shift, which means if we go further along here, we sh move out this bar to the, to the right, this will be longer and longer. And so we see the phase is linear in distance. And now don't get scared. This is the math work. Uh, you can read everything in the book by Ludwig Reimer, the high uh, transmission electron microscopy. And the only thing we want to focus on are these few points. The deflection angle beta, in the case of electrostatic deflection, is proportional to the electric field magnitude, strength, times the thickness of the specimen, which is, in a certain uh, aspect, it's a good news, because if your signal is too small, make your specimen thicker, and you get more signal. Uh, the same is true for the magnetic specimen. The deflection angle beta is proportional to the magnetic induction times the thickness. And the phase shift, this phase here, is proportional to the electric field times the thickness times the distance from an arbitrarily chosen origin. Um, and the same for the magnetic system. And in the end, everything boils down to these simple uh, facts. Phi, the phase, is proportional to E times T times X. Phi is proportional to B times T times X. And the angle beta is nothing than the derivative of the phase with respect to the distance. So the slope, the, the slope we saw in the first slide of, of the golf course. And this is what we measure. Differential phase contrast measures the, dif the slope of the phase. OK. Now we have two main scenarios we have to look at. Um, first, we talk about a homogeneous field. Uh, this is our electron microscope. This is the aperture, or better, over here. It's an, an aperture homogeneously filled with electrons, with light. Uh, and the lens causes a Fourier transform of this roundish hole and projects a tiny spot into the specimen. The tiny spot is seen here. This is the electron probe. And this is what you know from the lectures. It's an airy disk-like probe. Uh, and now, if we have a simple projected potential, which is only a slope, a ramp, it's a homogeneous field monot monotonously increasing, we superimpose the potential and the probe. That's what we have here. And if we now do a negative of an inverse Fourier transform, we find the exact aperture function as up here, but shifted by a tiny vector. So everything that happens is we shift this uh, aperture image by a tiny uh, displacement value. And you can imagine this quite uh, simply. If your electron uh, transmits an area that is filled by an electric field or a magnetic field, the electron will simply be shifted sideways due to the Lorentz force or the Coulomb force. And because all the electrons are affected simultaneously and identically, the whole image of the disk will simply be shifted. And this leads us to the nice situation that we only have to measure a shift of a disk. So we take one of these detectors, a ring detector, an annular detector, subdivided into four segments which I uh, name according to the numbers on, on the clock, 12, 3, 6, and 9. And if the beam is centered right on these four detectors, the difference signals between 3 and 9 and 12 and 6 would be 0. So we know it's centered. That's our 0 point. And if the greenish electron disk is shifted upward, we see 3 and 12 is illuminated more. 6 and 9 is illuminated less, so the difference will give us twice the signal of the shift. And we can understand this as a projection of the displacement vector onto the x and the y axis. So we get two images, uh, which we can then start to evaluate. Uh, this is just the same thing. Uh, shown as before, and this is how we operate it. We use this 
difference amplifiers to take the difference between 3 and 9 or 6 and 12. And to be uh, honest, this is more historical. Uh, nowadays, we have a fast analog to digital converters on every of these sectors. And we do everything later on because it's much better and much easier to correct for any errors that may occur during the acquisition if you have all the individual signals uh, right ahead. And this is our four quadrant detector where we measure a mere shift. That's a blown up image of our detector. And in our case, we have an inner ring, which is divided into four sectors, and an outer ring, which is quite handy if you want to modify the camera length, which means the size of the diffraction disk, or if your um, interaction is larger, then you have to use the outer ring. If it's uh, weaker, you, you use the inner ring. Now, how do images like that look like? We start with a magnetic specimen. And this is the sum image. And the sum image is simply the sum of all four uh, segments, the signals we get on all four segments added up. Now we see it's just a, a grainy pattern. We see some crystallites. But if we look for the images taken by sectors 12 and 6, we start to see some contrast. These are magnetic domains. And the same for sectors 3 and 9. And now the magic starts. We take now the difference between 12 and 6. And we have a nice bright contrast. And this is the momentum that the electron acquired in y direction. And this is the sensing direction. And you see if, if it's in positive direction, it's going to be white. In black means it's going to negative direction. And the same thing is true for 3 minus 9. We get a nice image. It looks somewhat equal, but also somewhat different, which is good. This is the px momentum component. and uh, this is the sensing direction. Now, what do we do with these images? Uh, as I said, every point, every pixel in here contains the component of the deflection in y direction. And the same pixel here contains the component of the deflection in x direction. So we have two components which we can add up to a vector. And because it's difficult to display all the vectors, uh, these are typically uh, 1k by 1k images. And you, you can't bring all these vectors on, onto a computer screen. So we use colors. And we build up these colorful maps. Now, how do we interpret this? We have the color wheel. First, you select an area where you're interested in the deflection. For example, this area here. Then you look for the same color in the color wheel. Starting from the origin, you draw a vector. And then you bring the vector back where the color originated. And because it's magnetic, we know the force is at right angles to, to the magnetic induction. So this would be the magnetic induction direction that you can look at. And uh, the saturation, you see, the more the saturation of the color is, the longer the vector. And we have all these uh, colors around. so we are now able to interpret what we see in types of uh, direction and strength of, of deflection of the beam. This is um, a movie that we assembled from various pictures. And it shows a magnetic sample, which has been um, subjected to an external magnetic field. And what you see is the dynamic process of a remagnetization of a sample. Uh, in a certain sense, uh, this is basically what happens on your hard disk when you change a bit from 0 to 1 or vice versa. Fortunately, not as chaotic as here, because people do a lot of efforts to prevent it from being very chaotic. But this is what nature would prefer to do. Uh, this is what you see here. This is a, a vortex, which runs through very quickly. And we have to learn how to handle this. Um, this is a simulation now I'm going to show you. Um, we start a relaxation from a random magnetization. You can think of a specimen which has been heated above the Curie temperature, which means the spins are decoupled. They are pointing in all different directions. And 
This would be the Fresnel image just from simple defocusing. You see nothing but a noisy pattern. The same, the face map and the contrast has been blown up a lot. Usually this would be just plain gray. And this is the differential phase contrast image. Again, we don't see anything. No wonder because it's not magnetic, the specimen. It's above Curie temperature. In the next slide, we see the movie. And you see the evolution of the magnetization as the specimen cools down. And we see a lot of information here. And we see also a lot of information here. But the pure phase map is difficult to interpret. We see um, some patches. But we do not see as much detail as we can see in this differential phase map. And now let's apply it to different samples. In this case, it is a PN junction, P and N. And we see in this sensing direction, we see a bright line. The bright line is the space charge in, uh, at the interface. We don't see the bright line here when the sensing direction is vertical which is OK. Um, this is just contamination. And if we construct our color map, again, we start to see the PN junction quite nicely. We can look at gallium arsenic nanowires. These have been grown in Regensburg by a colleague of mine. And we look at this section blown up here. And we realize these nanowires do not grow epitaxially. They uh, grow in wurzite type structures and then they switch over to zinc blende and then back to wurzite, zinc blende and so on. Now we know from these two different crystallographic types one is polar which means there is a tiny electric field inside the elementary cell of the wurzite and the other is nonpolar. This is just due to the arrangement of atoms and, and uh, charge centers in the unit cell. If you do our differential phase contrast image here, we see in the wurzite area, we see from crystal lattice plane to crystal lattice plane, we see a large change in signal, which is nothing more than the measurement of the local elementary uh, electric fields within uh, the cells. And if we switch over to zinc blende, it's just a noisy pattern, which means zinc blende itself is nonpolar. It's not, not charged. OK, next step. We now go to inhomogeneous fields, because we, we nearly approach them right now. Um, lattice planes are, let's say, two, three angstroms apart. And we have to take care what happens if we have uh, for example, two atoms at the same time in our probe diameter. Now, that's what we deal with here. We have the same arrangement as before. The aperture is homogeneously filled by electrons. Uh, they are projected into the specimen plane. But now, in the specimen plane, this is the probe. But now we have the atomic potentials. And immediately, we see the atomic potentials can affect several atomic potentials can affect the electron probe at the same time, as it is shown here. Obviously, the center part is affected by this at atom, but uh, we have slightly affected area, uh, airy rings by the surrounding atoms, too. And what happens if we go into our detector plane by inverse Fourier transform? We do have um, an inhomogeneously lit or illuminated diffraction disk. So we have a complicated diffractive redistribution of intensities in this diffraction disk. Now, what can we learn from that? We wanted to know about deflections. And the good news is um, we can look at the average momentum transfer to the ensemble, the full ensemble of electrons, which means we just evaluate this equation. And this tells us what the average electron passing through the specimen in this point will experience in terms of sideways momentum. Um, even though the disk itself does not move, but the center of intensity does move, as you can see in, in this picture here, uh, this would be the disk. But the intensity has been reshaped into this, this crescent shape. And the center of intensity would be somewhere here. Now, 
this is a simulation, we again see a very simplistic uh, crystallographic um, um, a crystal uh, atoms sitting on square sites, square lat lattice sites. Here you see the probe and you see this uh, individual potentials wandering through the probe and here this is the diffraction disk that you would be able to monitor in the detection plane. And we will uh, soon switch into a, a high contrast image so you can see it even better. And uh, in this high contrast image, we realize that we have the airy disks and now you start to see we have many potentials at the same time affecting the airy disk, which means we have a very complicated interplay between the potentials and our uh, electron probe. And also, you see up here, uh, there is a redistribution of intensity within the diffraction disk, and this is what we have to uh, look after. And down here, these are the horizontal and the vertical components of the deflection, and we start to see the in individual atoms in there. Uh, this is another movie just showing you the evolution of this central uh, diffraction disk as we approach an atomic column. And again, this is the information we have to process. Ideally, we have all this in, in a type of a movie uh, to look at. And again, that's the situation. And let's have a, a look at another detector, which is ideal for this type of detection. This is the pixelated detector. It's more or less a standard camera, of course, a bit modified to take direct electron beams. The uh, cells are a bit larger. They fit in either up here into the microscope or underneath, no matter what. And again, we have to evaluate uh, this equation to get some information out. Now, this is what we see here. This is a layered magnetic structure. We are moving the beam from top to bottom. Here we are out in the vacuum. That's the situation now. And now, if I mark the boundary of the beam, you see it's shifted sideways. And this is because it's moving through different magnetized magnetic areas. Uh, and the beam is being deflected sideways. I think it's quite obvious to see here. And this is the zero position, the undeflected beam, which we can take as a reference. Now, this is a, a quite busy uh, slide, but we don't have to go through any detail, but uh, every detail. But in short, what we have up here, this is a unit cell of gallium nitride. And from this unit cell, we pick out the red square. We have a gallium atom here. We have a nitrogen atom here. And now we place the electron probe in the corner here at position one, uh, far away from any atom. And in this case, this is the diffraction disk we get, which is more or less evenly illuminated because it hasn't been affected by any potential of the atoms. If we now move the probe close to the gallium atom, that's the crescent shape we saw before, uh, where we can start to evaluate the shift of the lateral momentum by evaluating the equation I showed you before. Now, this has been applied to simulations. Uh, for every pixel, uh, Knut Müller and co-workers, they calculated these disks, and they are shown here. And we see quite, quite clearly there are five positions where the disks form a specific pattern. And outside, it's more or less uniform, except that we see four patches here. Uh, where we also get some information. This is the vector presentation of the simulation. And the experiment has been done using strontium titanate. That's the real experiment. This is the vector representation. And these are the really acquired diffraction disk maps. And if you compare these, again, it's been the first time ever doing this, we see a patch up here, we see a patch here, a patch here, and two patches down here. So it resembles quite a lot what we would expect. And uh, new experiments, uh, that's the experiment, that's the simulation. Uh, we do an average over these uh, areas here. This would be the projected charge density that we can retrieve 
from the simulation. This is the projected charge density that can be retrieved from the experiment. And I think that's quite convincing. Uh, we really see the charge densities inside our specimen. And even better, the probe is now so small we can move in between the atoms and probe the space between the atoms as well. Okay, this is the detector we uh, started to use in Regensburg. It's quite simple. It's, it's a com commercial type detector, a position sensitive device. That's what it look, looks like. It's an intrinsic layer and we have an N-doped layer and a P-doped layer and it's pre-charged. So if an electron beam hits the intrinsic layer, it creates an electron hole pair. Uh, due to the pre-charging, the holes are pulled upward, the electrons are pulled downward. And now here in this, we call it resistive layer, the, uh, the holes have to decide whether they go left or right. We have two conductors here, X1 and X2, but the resistance going to X1 is much smaller compared to the resistance going to X2. So the holes have to decide where to go and the majority of holes will of course go over here and only a minority will go over here. So what we measure is the total current here and the total current here and we take the difference and the difference tells us exactly this deviation from the center point where the electron beam hits. If we move the green beam further to X1, this current will increase a lot, this will decrease a lot, so we get the position in X direction. Now the Y direction is done by the negative charge carriers, which are underneath, and you see up here, these are the upper conductor bars. This would be X1, X2 up here, and underneath the detector, we have the same arrangement, but in this direction. So the holes, account for the x direction, the electrons account for the y direction. And we can do two di directions at the same time. It's very fast, it's rather cheap. Uh, this chip costs about 2,000 euros. Um, and you can do a huge image immediately. And this is a view into our microscope. Uh, this would be our four quadrant detector and this is the stage that we assembled to uh, host the PSD. And this is the feed through that we assembled and it has, it's like a, it's an easily exchangeable uh, mount up there. So we can have many detectors and we just open the microscope briefly and pull one out and stick the other one in. And within half an hour, it's back to operation again. Uh, this is the linearity. You see the detector here. We have a special holder which allows us to apply defined, well-defined electric fields to the electric, electron beam. And we see there's a very, very good linearity of deflection uh, depending on the applied voltage. So we are very nice and linear over a wide shift range of up to four millimeters. And these are the magnetic images. You see the sensing directions acquired using the four quadrant detector or our PSD and you would be able to tell the difference. So we are quite happy with the performance of this one. And we can even acquire images like that. This is strontium titanate and it is a 2000 by 2000 field of view and it is acquired in 1.5 minutes uh, at a resolution of 11 picometers and the data set is 400 megabytes large. In contrast, if you use a Merlin camera, it has a resolution of 256 by 256 pixels. So that's the field of view of the Merlin camera. Um, the frame time is also two minutes, same pixel size, but the file size is four gigabytes, and you have to deal with that. And in more recent uh, cameras, I received data sets of up to 32 gigabytes and most of the regular personal computers don't even have enough memory to handle this uh, size so you have to do special processing to get the numbers out. In the end, the number is a small, small number. The file size is very small but you have to get the numbers out. 
Just to give you some examples, this is barium titanate on strontium titanate. This is the sensing direction. It's a 2K by 4K image in X direction. And this is a blown up image. You see there's no distortion, very nice uh, linearity. And the same thing for the vertical direction, uh, the blow up. And we can really start to measure the fields around individual atoms. This I like a lot. It's a dislocation in gallium nitride. You see the dislocation here. And you see it especially before, because it's a differential phase contrast image. We see the sensing directions. You will see an image later of a pure bright field image. And it's difficult to, to see this uh, feature at all. But in differential phase contrast, immediately we see it. We can go to higher magnifications. We start to see the individual atoms. And we can start to understand what causes this uh, contrast here. This is the silicon germanium quantum well I showed you before. It looks more or less dull. It's a bright field image. But if we go to differential phase contrast, that's what we see. There's a lot going on. We have a dislocation going in here. We have something else coming in here. We have a feature here, a bump here, which is not visible at all in this bright field image. And this is the corresponding vertical deflection image. So we get a lot more information, and we have to learn how to interpret it. What does it tell us? Now, some words about the future. Um, prediction is very difficult, especially about the future. This is a sentence which has been credited uh, to Karl Valentin, which is a Bavarian comedian, or Mark Twain, who is also supposed to uh, be the person who first said it, or even Niels Bohr. Uh, I looked at the sentence up in Wikipedia and found all three which are <laughs> uh, thought to have said it the first time. OK, what could we do? What has been done in the recent uh, past? Uh, we did transfer the Heisenberg's uncertainty relation to differential phase contrast. And I'm going to show you the result uh, in a second. Um, we tried anti-ferromagnetism. And you might say, anti-ferromagnetism, how's that going to work? Anti-ferromagnets have opposing spins up and spin down, so they cancel out the magnet magnetization completely. But if your probe is small enough to cover only one spin, only one row of spins, you will have a tiny deflection to one side and then a tiny deflection to the other side. We tried it, and it works. Um, of course, biological specimens, we see nice results, but uh, biologists should uh, care about uh, pushing the technique further on. Um, I want to make a suggestion for time-resolved measurements, which is still to demonstrate that it works. But I think it may be very interesting because we can apply electric, magnetic, optic stimuli. We may even have more uh, types of stimuli uh, that we can apply to the specimen and measure the reaction of the specimen. Um, I have been recently successful in electron exit wave reconstruction, which means we reconstruct the potential surface that I showed you in the first slide. We can see now these wave bumping and um, learn a lot of, from that. I know there are attempts elsewhere to visualize electronic bonds between the atoms by looking at the space between the atoms. This has not been done in Regensburg. I'm quite eager to, to learn what comes out of uh, from there. Uh, we have an extreme sensitivity for minor crystal tilts. Even if, if your crystal is only tilted very, very slightly, we get huge contrasts. This may be considered to be an, a disadvantage, but uh, as a physicist, we are all optimists. So it, it is an advantage if we have a very sensitive technique. So we have to look for where we can use it. And we can reduce artifacts by the separation of the divergence of the field and the rotation of the field contributions. I'm going to show you an example for that briefly. This is the Heisenberg's uncertainty relation. If you look at the first term, larger than h bar over 2, that's the familiar Heisenberg equation, right? Uh, if we now use it for TPC, and this has been 
written down and explained in, in this ultramicroscopy paper, uh, this would be the lateral momentum transfer to the electrons, which means the sensitivity to the uh, potentials in the specimen. And this would be the lateral resolution of our uh, electron microscope. And the product of these two has been larger than h bar over 2 times 1 over the square root of the number of electrons used. So this means if we only use one electron, we shoot it through the sample and we measure the deflection, then this is the standard Schrodinger uh, Heisenberg's uncertainty equation. But if we start to use many, many, many electrons, this is going to decrease a lot. And if we want to have a fixed lateral resolution, we can gain a lot in momentum resolution or vice versa. So it's a very handy equation to determine the requirements for a specific experiment if you want to have a, a specific resolution either laterally or in terms of momentum. This is the anti-ferromagnet. I did a simulation uh, as before. This would be the potential map and I tried to create a very naive uh, domain structure here. We see these would be spins pointing upward, these would be spins pointing downward, and of course here the spins are aligned at right angles. That's the simulation you saw before, and we start to see the anti-ferromagnetic signal quite clearly, and I try the same thing with a real anti-ferromagnet which I got supplied from Philip Krischek. Um, this is the bright field, the sum image, where we see a faint structure, but if we turn on the DPC, we see immediately a very strong striping, which is more or less the, uh, the lattice spacing between spin up rows and spin, spin down, down rows. And this is a, a different specimen, also anti-ferromagnetic, and again, we start to see these domain patterns. So we are there uh, using better microscopes. We may be easily in, in a position to determine the antiferromagnetic structure and even domain structures within the antiferromagnets in more detail. This is again the biological specimen, uh, the two sensing directions, the reconstructed color map, and immediately you realize there's a lot of detail to be seen which uh, can be seen in unstained specimen. Uh, biologists usually stain the specimen uh, which is a, a difficult task because the stains are poisonous and they change the structure of the specimen. But these are unstained specimens and we get a lot of contrast in there. This is my suggestion for the future. We have a stationary beam at a certain position of the specimen where we expect something to happen if a stimul stimulus is applied. Let's say this would be a magnetic specimen and we would expect um, the magnetism to change if we apply a stimulus, for example a photon, and in this case the magnetism would change and the beam would be deflected and if we are fast enough we can do time resolved measurements. We could have a, a short pulse up here and we try to see the deflection if we have a detector that is fast enough uh, to measure what happened in this point up here. And of course the stimuli can be optical, electric, magnetic, thermal, you name it. Uh, and we built a specimen holder for that. Uh, you see this is a standard, more or less standard specimen holder which has a quartz uh, tube inside so we can apply a laser in here and the quartz tube comes out here. The specimen would sit underneath the flap and we can apply a, a laser beam onto the specimen and try to provoke any action of the specimen. Exit wave reconstruction. This is one of the images I showed you before. It's a rather blunt image. We see a bright area, a dark area with maybe some uh, stripes in there. These are the differential phase contrast sensing directions. We see a lot more in, of detail. If we reconstruct the color map, we can also reconstruct the phase the wave fronts, and this is only the horizontal part of the wave front, that's the vertical part, 
That's the full part. If you now had one of these fancy 3D uh, goggles in mag magenta and red, you would see immediately a 3D impression. But we can also uh, go to a, a rendering of this image where you can see this is the shape of the outgoing wave front. And of course, now we can start to understand what it tells us and what we can finally do with it. The same thing here. Uh, this is the substrate material, and we have a multi-quantum -quant well, and we realize there is something. There is a dislocation or something up there. Let's look at the differential phase contrast images. We see a huge range of different contrasts, and we see this does not end here, as it is suggested in the bright field image. It extends further on. We can do the color co uh, coding. We can do the 3D wavefront imaging. And this is, again, uh, a rendering of the wavefront. And we see this is the trench. This is um, this uh, feature here, which extends through the interface. And we start to understand what this means. These are the layers that you see up here. These are the quantum layers. Uh, but this dislocation extends far into the substrate and causes a distortion of the wavefront. And if this would be an optical or electronic device, this distortion might uh, be uh, dangerous to the uh, properties of the device. OK, don't get scared. This is going to be very brief. I think I have shown to you what we measure basically is the force that acts on the electron. We shoot an electron into the specimen. The specimen sees a force, either electrostatic or magnetic, and is being deflected. So that's the force, electric and magnetic deflection. Now, the point is, let's try to do what we measure is a vector field of the forces, a two-dimensional vector field. And according to the vector operators, we can apply a rotational operation. So this is nabla times f. And if we write it down, we come up to this point. We see there is a constant. The speed of the electron in z direction is constant. And we have two zeros. And this is, if we extend it, nothing but the divergence of b. So we know immediately this is also 0, because the divergence of an induction is 0. So we found out that the rotation of our force vector field has to be 0 in any case. Um, what we further do is we take this part and call it the rotation image. We, we simply compute the rotation of the vector field. We know it's only, uh, it only has a z component. And the z component is converted into a contrast to see anything at all. But we expect the z component to be 0. So we expect the rotation to be 0. The divergence of our vector field is different. This will give any number. You've seen this before. The divergence of an electric field is just the charge density over epsilon 0. And we get some divergence from magnetic fields as well. But the important message is math tells us the rotation of our force vector field should be 0. To test it, we took a magnetic specimen, which contains a magnetic vortex that you can see here. This is the so-called scattergram, um, a display of all the possible deflections of the electron beam. So no deflection would be in here. And we see there is an even deflection in all directions. So this is a rotational uh, vortex, a magnetic vortex. These are uh, streamlines, which means if you would drop an electron here, uh, it would follow the streamlines pointing outward. So the force is going outward. If we have a rotational induction here, the force will simply go outward if we shoot an electron into the specimen, because it goes at right angles. Uh, this is our face surface, again, in accordance with anything we, we know. And this is just a contour map, again, showing these concentric circles, showing there is a an even phase distribution. But now, if we look at the divergence image, we have a bright spot in the center, right where we have this point here, which is OK. This is exactly what we would expect. 
and we don't have a curl signal apart from the noisy pattern uh, here. So everything seems to be fine. We have a purely magnetic specimen and uh, only a divergence signal. Now let's look. Ah, let me skip that. It's just uh, there is a a thing called Helmholtz decomposition, which means you can decompose any vector field into uh, components which only contain divergence and only contain rotation. And the idea was because rotation has to be zero, we separate them and the rotation has to be noise, which we see here. And so if we subtract the noise from the original, we get a bit smoother patterns and there's a bit less uh, patchiness in our images. But then I try the same thing on our dislocation. This is the bright field image. The dislocation is barely visible here. We see it in the DPC images. The scattergram tells us this is the vacuum area, undeflected. And then we have two patches which are roughly 42 degrees apart. This is the composite color coded image. These are the path lines and we see the path lines end at, at the edge of the specimen, again at an angle of about 42 degrees, but they converge towards the dislocation. And now the interesting, ah, this is the reconstruction. Uh, we see in the vacuum area it's flat and then it goes out, up. This is quite monotonous, which means uh, it's a, a wedge shape. And we see it here, if we draw a line, across here, it's going steep down and then it flattens out again. If you look at the divergence image of this vector uh, pattern, we see there is a divergence, but we also see there is a curl. And the curl shouldn't be there because we just proved mathematically it can't be. So what's the matter? We superimpose the streamlines here on our specimen and we see here there is some sort of rotation of these path lines. So something does not strictly deflect in one direction, but there is a curvature in there, which gives rise to a curl. Now what's behind that? Um, I'm convinced now this is a screw dislocation that we have here, which means we have a plane up here and then a step down and then a second plane underneath the original plane. And if you would drop an electron here, it would run around the corner. It would be deflected down the slope. And I tried, uh, this is the wedge, which is giving us the slope up here. Now, using the decomposition algorithm, we can decompose the vector field into its pure divergence part, and these are the components, the pure curl part, with these components and this is a simple model that I uh, built. If you, for computational reasons, I just took this part and mirrored it so it's being uh, symmetric. This is the phase map. These would be the individual atoms and this would be the ramp down and you see there is a curvature included uh, and this is the curvature which causes uh, the rotation of the curl component. And this is a purely geometrical phase. So our math work was right. It's not caused by electric or magnetic fields, but simply because one row of atoms is higher than the other, which means the scattered electrons suffer a difference in time. And this gives us a phase shift, and this may contain a curl. And we can, again, decompose it. We can look at the images, and we see uh, the simulation gives us the same type of curl that we saw before. Okay, summary. Uh, I showed you that we can have DPC contrast from electric magnetic fields, from biological specimens where it's caused by density variations, and we could see a geometric phase close to a screw dislocation. Um, what you can do, the most prominent things are wavefront reconstruction. We are very sensitive to minute specimen tilts. We can see anti-ferromagnets, uh, possibly get some time resolution into the electron microscope. 
And this is something I'm quite proud of. Uh, we extended the Heisenberg's uncertainty relation uh, and we can now really predict how many electrons do you need for a specific resolution in momentum and, um, and lateral resolution. Uh, let me acknowledge a couple of persons. John Chapman, Glasgow University, he's the person who taught me about uh, differential phase contrast. Also his successor, Stephen McVitty, um, Bert Freitag from Thermo Fisher, he allowed me to use the instruments and he gave me a lot of confidential instrument details which are quite handy to have. Uh, Knut Müller-Kaspari, who gave me a lot of insights into the picometer range DPC. Uh, my local team is Felix Schwarzhuber, now Dr. Schwarzhuber, Dr. Pöllert, Dr. Wild, Peter Melzel, Christopher Habenschaden, who constructed the feed-through for our detector, and many, many more. And this is a picture my former students gave me for retirement. They are not all of them, but they are the ones who have been responsible for a lot of physics at Regensburg University. And having said that, and I've been introduced as a retired person, you may wonder what is my personal future? Certainly not this. Um, there are so many nice uh, areas in the Alps, nice streets where I want to go with my motorbike, um, nice areas in Italy with my wife where she enjoys a cappuccino or two. Uh, in France, I like still to read some books. I like to sit somewhere and enjoy an ice cream and never forget about think ab about physics. And having that said that, I would like to thank you for your attention and I hope you found it a bit entertaining. That's a good question. We, we never really thought about it in detail. It's just the, the supplier just gives you numbers. You should apply so, so and so many uh, volts to have optimum operation and that's what we used. But I, I think we more or less, apart from immediate uh, recombination, which always occurs, but most of the electrons and holes are being pulled apart immediately and because the intrinsic layer is a high resistive layer and then we have these uh, resistive layers on top and bottom and they are compared to the intrinsic layer they are at the same potential so the charge carriers go up and down and then they decide to go laterally so I'm hoping we get most of of the electron hole pairs but I couldn't give you a number of how many Yes, a lot. <laughs> How do you calibrate it? Um, we found a, a quite simple way also on, on this edge specimen um, because any edge will cause a deflection of the beam either outward or inward. This is difficult to, to determine. Uh, the direction is difficult to determine, but we know it's always at right angles to the edge. And I, I also did a simulation, for example, of a hole and you see it's always at right angles to the edge of the hole. So what we do, the deflection can be converted into a divergence. So we calculate a divergence of our vector map and we rotate the vectors by 360 degrees and look for the maximum. And if we find the maximum, we know this is the rotational difference between the scan direction and the detector direction. And this seems to be quite reliable and quite precise within, let's say, five degrees. So, so you said the Merlin camera has arguably too many pixels and it's too slow. And uh, 
segmented detectors have very few pixels and high fat. What's the optimum number of elements? Um, I can't give you a clear number, but I've heard of, of quite promising results when you have uh, 16. It's like uh, four rings subdivided in four, four segments each. They give you some indication of what's going on, a, a very coarse picture, and it's still quite, quite fast. Thank you.